Justice roll like a river, like a river
my home is Christ alone is where you are is where I'm home if knowing you is my delight if in God alone I'm satisfied. Then won't you come and break this old heart of stone? Start a fire in these broken bones. Here's my soul, it has been exposed. God of ages past, convince my heart of lies, come tell me of all I have. Grace and peace be with you. Tonight we are gathered as a church family to celebrate an ancient gathering known as Ash Wednesday. And this is the night that begins our season of Lent, which lasts until Easter Sunday. And tonight begins a season of preparation. We're preparing. We're remembering that death and resurrection are real. Jesus, God the Son, tasted death and accomplished resurrection from the dead. So in the season of Lent, we prepare by experiencing and participating 
in spiritual postures and practices, soberly facing our own sin, our own depravity, our own wretchedness. We confess our sin, we turn from our sin, and we bow our hearts and our lives in complete submission to the Lord. It's a season where we're going to be fasting and praying. We're going to be meditating, steeping in scripture. And we seek the face of Christ because he first sought us and he first loved us. So tonight you're invited. We invite you to experience and to participate in a singular vision of God. You're invited to be slow and to be careful so listen to what the Holy Spirit is doing in you, what he's doing in you through the word of God. And when you have a sense of something tonight that you need to confess, confess it. We invite you to have breath prayers. God have mercy, Lord have mercy. Lord forgive me, Lord be gracious to me a sinner. And as you acknowledge, relationships that need to be addressed. Maybe you have thoughts come about stresses and worries and anxieties. Maybe you have the hand ringing. Let the hand ringing come. Let it come to the surface. Jesus stands ready to save you. Tonight, we're reminded of our mortality, we're reminded of our rebellion against God. We're reminded of the rebellion against God of the first man, Adam, who brought a curse. Scripture tells us this is what God said to Adam. He said, the ground is cursed because of you. You'll eat it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It'll produce thorns and thistles for you and you'll eat plants of the field. You'll eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground since you were taken from it. For you are dust and you will return to dust. We remember tonight we are dust. We experience death because of sin, rebellion, against God. So tonight, let's take a posture of prayer. If you will, stand with me. Be slow. As we push on into the presence of God, be slow. Let's say this together. Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love. According to your abundant compassion, blot out my rebellion. Completely wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin, for I am conscious of my rebellion. Against you, you alone, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Let's have a singular vision of God. <laughs>
Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Surely you desire integrity in the inner self. And you teach me wisdom deep within. Pray this. Purify me with hyssop and I would be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you've broken rejoice. Turn your face from my sins and blot out all my guilt. God, create a clean heart for me. And renew a spirit, a spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence. But take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me. And sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. And then I will teach the rebellious your ways. And sinners will return to you. Shining to our night, 
drive our dark away till your glory fills our eyes. Jesus Christ, shine into our night. Bind us to your cross. We find He are responsible for our sin, yet God the Son bore the punishment for our sin on our behalf. Yet he himself bore our sicknesses, and he carried our pains, but we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities, punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. Has no hold on me. Feels lost, haven't been redeemed. Jesus has made me. To joy that's found in peace, grace, hope, and wondrous things that reach me not on earth here.
Alrighty, in case we've never met before, uh, my name is Lyle. If this is your first time here, just want to say welcome. Uh, I know it's kind of weird to say that, but uh, we usually have some people on Ash Wednesday show up here. Uh, normally this is in the morning, and we used to do this in the morning for many years, and we'd have like 10 people show up. <laughs> it was like, all right, we got to figure something out here. This ain't working. So a few years ago, we moved it to 630 in the evening, and I, and I realize it kind of messes up a little bit because you're supposed to spend the day meditating, thinking on your own brevity of life, your death. And so it kind of messes it up as we do it at the end of the day. It's maybe not the best thing to go to bed sleeping and thinking on, uh, but maybe you can, can continue into uh, Thursday and think on this also. So I just want to spend a few minutes um, talking about the brevity of our life and, um, and what that looks like for us in our own living. And I'm going to use Psalm 39 as kind of a, a guide for us. So... Um, so yeah, if you've got a Bible, I encourage you to grab it, and you can just remain seated. I'm going to read this passage a couple of times. Um, in fact, what I'll do, instead of doing two times, I'm just going to read it slowly and uh, pause where it says Selah, which is a hard word to translate in our English. Um, I think what people say and most scholars say, it usually means to pause, to think, to reflect, to stop for a few minutes. So we won't stop for a few minutes. We'll stop for a few seconds. And, um, and one of the things that I try to do when I read devotionally, um, and I'm not saying I do this well, but I try to slow down and I really try to focus on listening and hearing and paying attention to what kind of um, stirs in me when I read something. And so when, I, when that happens, I'll... Sometimes just jot it down in my journal. I'll circle it in my Bible. Um, and sometimes it goes away after that. But then other times I come back to it. I don't know if you guys have noticed these last few weeks, I've, I've just kind of stuck in Psalm 23, where surely goodness and mercy follows you all the days of your life. And that little phrase has just been something that God just impressed in my heart. I've been thinking, processing, and reflecting and bringing that before him. And so... Um, so as I read this, you, you may have not brought something to write on, but all of us have got phones, amen, uh, or most of us do. Uh, I would just encourage you to kind of maybe uh, jot a word, a phrase that maybe comes to you, and maybe this is something the Lord is going to stir in you over the next week, and especially during the season of Lent. So, um, yeah, start in verse 1, Psalm 39. Most likely this is a psalm from David. So hear what the word of the Lord says. He says, I, I said, I will guard my ways so that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle as long as the wicked are in my presence. I was speechless and quiet. I kept silent even from speaking good and my pain intensified. My heart grew hot within me and as I mused, I, a fire burned. I spoke with my tongue Lord, make me aware of my end and the number of my days so that I will know how short-lived I am. In fact, you have made my days just inches long, and my lifespan is nothing to you. Yes, every human being stands only a vapor. 
Selá. Verse 6. Yes, a person goes about like a mere shadow. Indeed, they rush around in vain, gathering possessions without knowing who will get them. Now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. Rescue me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the taunt of fools. I am speechless. I do not open my mouth because of what you have done. Remove your torment from me because of the force of your hand. I am finished. You discipline a person with punishment for iniquity, consuming like a moth what is, a, what is precious to him. Yes, every human being is only a vapor. Selah. Verse 12, hear my prayer, Lord, and listen to, the, to my cry for help. Do not be silent at my tears, for I am here with you as an alien, a temporary resident like all my ancestors. Turn your angry gaze from me so that I may be cheered up before I die and I'm gone. I don't know uh, if you grew up practicing Ash Wednesday. It was definitely not something in my home or what we did. We grew up in church, but we never did Lent or Ash Wednesday at all. And, um, and maybe even something like this is confusing and like, what is this and what are we doing and why are we observing Ash Wednesday? Well, as Rick said, Ash Wednesday begins the season of Lent, and Lent is the kind of 40 days before Easter, not counting Sunday. So if you go home and and count up, you'll say, well, I was wrong. It's more than 40. Well, you don't count the Sundays. And it's a, it's a uh, Lent is marked, as Rick said at the very beginning, as, um, as a time of preparation, right? And that preparation is, is for Easter, is for us to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so I don't, I don't know about you guys, and I say this often because I think it's good for us to be reminded of this. Um, Easter is one of those holidays that always sneaks up on you. I mean, Christmas doesn't, or at least it better not, right? <laughs> you may have some family members and some kiddos pretty mad, like, oh, man, I totally forgot about this. But it does sneak up on us when it comes to Easter. I found that to be the case when I was growing up. And there's a way that Lent um, causes us to stop or, or ask us or invites us. You don't have to. Right? We're not getting brownie points from God by doing this, right? That's not how we believe. We believe that Jesus has paid everything for us. And so we're not getting something from God. We're not getting some reward. We're not earning something from him. But it's an invitation for us to draw near to him so that the experience of God's presence can be more felt and more realized in our lives. So it is. It's a time of kind of preparation where we stop, we focus, we reflect, we get ourselves ready and prepared for the resurrection, this wonderful celebration that we'll have in a few weeks. And the unique thing about Ash Wednesday is it's a one service that we get to talk about one thing that we don't love to talk about, and that is death. We actually get to remind ourselves of how brief life is, something that all of us, including me, give little thought to throughout the year. And so, so in one way, Ash Wednesday is an enormous gift for us really is. Because the Bible over and over talks about the brevity of life. And we have a tendency, if you're anything like me, just to kind of like, yeah, that's for somebody else, right? I've been, I don't know if fascination is a good word for it, but I have read Tim Keller's article that he did. I mentioned this a few months ago in the Atlantic when he first found out if he had, um, you know, terminal cancer. And just there's a lot in that article, just stuff to sit with and think on. And here's a quote from it that reminds us of how little we ever really think about our own brief life here. He said this, I think it's on the screen. One of the first things I learned 
was that religious faith does not automatically provide solace in times of crisis. A belief in God and in the afterlife does not become spontaneously comforting and existentially strengthening. Despite my rationale and conscious acknowledgement that I would die someday, the shattering reality of a fatal diagnosis provoked a remarkably strong psychological denial of mortality. Instead of acting on Dylan Thomas's advice to rage, rage against the dying of the night light, and I quoted this before, I found myself thinking, what? No, I can't die. That happens to others, not to me. When I said these outrageous words out loud, I realized that this delusion had been the actual operating principle of my heart. And I think all of us, man, if we're kind of honest, we would say the last sentence and say, yeah, that's, that's the way I operate. And Ash Wednesday has at its aim to help us remember that we are going to die. And that our life is very brief on this earth. So that's what I want to do. I just want to look at this psalm real quick. I just want to highlight a couple things out of here and really just kind of land in the middle there where David prays that God would help him see his own brevity. So if you go back, if you've got your own Bible, look, what, look how this starts. It, it's a kind of a troubling psalm. I'm not unpacking it in its entirety. And, and maybe this is a psalm you, you read throughout the six weeks of Lent. This is the one you just kind of keep coming back to. Maybe you memorize it. Um, but there's a lot in here. It's kind of troubling. And then, quite frankly, I don't know exactly what to do with. But verse 1, look what he says. I said, I, I'll guard my ways so that I may not sin with my tongue. I'll, I'll guard my mouth with a muzzle as long as the wicked are in my presence. I was speechless and quiet. I kept silent, even from speaking good. And my pain intensified. My heart grew hot within me as I mused. A fire burned. I spoke with my tongue. So some of what you try to do when you look at a psalm is you try to figure out what's the situation that the psalmist is writing this in. So most likely this is David, and almost all psalms are written in some kind of situation. What's the circumstance? What, what's coming out of this? And some are clear and some are really unclear, and I, and I think the unclarity of some of those is on purpose so that we, readers in 2022, can resonate and and identify with a psalmist. Like we can put our situation, our circumstance in that. So I think the vagueness sometimes is obviously on purpose. And so here, we don't know exactly what's going on, but something's happened to David to where he doesn't even want to speak around the company of the wicked or, or around people that are not followers of God because he's a little nervous about what he might say about God. He's kind of a little... There's a little trepidation there, a little concern of what may come out of his mouth in the presence of people that don't really love Jesus or love God. And so he's, he's kind of muzzling his mouth. He's, he's holding it back. And so the question is, like, what's going on? You know, why is he doing that? Well, if you skip down to verse 8, we get some kind of hint of what's happening to David here. Verse 8 says this. This is this cry to God, rescue me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the taunt of fools. God, save me, save me. Verse 9, I am speechless. I do not open my mouth because of what you have done. Remove your torment from me. Those are hard words to hear. Because of the force of your hand, I am finished. You discipline, there's the key word, you discipline a person with punishment for iniquity, consuming like a moth what is precious to him. Yes, every human being is only a vapor, Selah. So in some way, we don't know exactly what's going on here. We don't know the, the full situation, what's happening. But somehow David is being disciplined by his own personal sin. This is not a God that's just kind of, you know, out of the blue decide, you know, I just want to make David's life miserable. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, so I'm going to go for it. You know, that's not what's going on here. That's not who God is. Like, we know who God is. We know the character of God. He's, he's slow to anger. He's patient. He's loving, he's kind, he's gracious, he's long-suffering. We know that. We see that in the, not only just in the evidence in the New Testament with God incarnate, but we also see it in the evidence of the, all of the Old Testament. I mean, you read the Old Testament, you don't think God is like quick to anger. He's very slow to it. And so obviously what's going on here at some level with David is that he has sinned against God and he's being disciplined like any good father does with his children. 
And this discipline doesn't feel good. Like when I discipline my kids, they never come back and say, thank you for that wonderful discipline, right? They never come back and say, that felt so good. Thank you so much. They don't. And maybe later on they're thankful for it. But in the moment, it's hard. It's difficult. It hurts. It's painful. They don't like it. They complain. They pout. They mope. All these kind of things, right? That's kind of in essence what's going on here. He goes on and says, look what he says in verse 12. Hear my prayer, Lord, and listen to my cry for help. Do not be silent at my tears, for I am here with you as an alien, a temporary resident like all ancestors. Turn your angry gaze from me so that I may be cheered up before I die and am gone. So in essence, he's asking God to, to, to stop, you know, like relent here. Uh, may the discipline be done. You know, turn your, some translations say, look away from me. And obviously David's not literally saying that. Sometimes we say stupid things. We're in desperate situations and God knows that. And it's kind of similar to what Peter said when uh, Jesus, uh, you, know, ca- you know, caught all those fish and Peter said, depart from me, get away from my presence. I'm a sinful person. Well, Jesus didn't do that, right? He didn't go away from him. So sometimes we speak kind of silly things. And in essence, what David is just asking, please turn your, your anger, your, your rightful discipline away from me so that I can enjoy and be cheered up. But notice the, the first thing that comes out of David's mouth when he talks, right? So we kind of know what's going on in David's life, right? So these two bookends. But when he speaks, notice what he says, verse 4. He doesn't ask. The first words that come out of his mouth is not take this off of me. The first words that come out of his mouth in verse 4 is, Lord, Lord, make me aware of my end and the number of my days so that I will know how short-lived I am. In fact, you have made my days just inches long and my lifespan is nothing to you. Yes, every human being stands as only a vapor. Yes, a person goes about like a mere shadow. Indeed, they rush around in vain gathering possessions without knowing will get them. So the first thing that comes out of David's mouth when he decides to speak, and he, and he doesn't speak this directly to those who are far from God, but he speaks this directly to God in verse 4, Lord, make me aware of my end and the numbers of my days. Make me aware of this. Make me aware of the brevity of my own life and the end, where I'm going, how short it is, and the inches of my lifespan here. And so when we, when we look at even in Psalm 39, as well as all the other places like Psalm 90 and several times in Ecclesiastes where it talks about the brevity of life and, and even the prayer that Moses gives, God, you know, teach me to number my days so I can gain a heart of wisdom. Sometimes I want to ask like, what does it look like when God answers this prayer that David said here in verse four, make me aware of my end and the number of my days. What does that look like in real life? And when I'm aware of my own brevity, I think for some of us, and maybe it's just me, because this is kind of what I think, but some of us, I feel like it, um, to live with an awareness of the certainty of my death and the brevity of my life, it creates, um, I've got this angstiness of living that I've got to, I got to get things done. I got to really work hard. I've got to, you know, my life is going to be short. So I better accomplish a lot of stuff and I better do everything right. And it kind of like, I know I'm moving my arms. Like that's what like inside of me, it kind of creates this angstiness. You know, it's like, oh my goodness, brief life. I got to make sure I use it well. Oh, you know, like, like we get all freaked out. It's almost like, you know, uh, when your kids are young and you get like someone takes your kids for three hours, right? You remember those, for those you maybe you're in it right now, but when you got your kids, you don't have kids for three hours. It's like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do, right? We only got three hours. And we're just like, everything we want to do. And you know, like, like it creates this angstiness. Yeah, there you go. Thank you, Justin. A little amen there. This has got a newborn too, man. Um, I don't think that's what it means for us. When we have a, a, an awareness of the briefness of our life, I don't think it's supposed to create this, this angstiness. I, I mean, I, 
There's probably other ways you can describe this. I just, I just think what I'm, we're after is just faithful living. And I think faithful living includes a lot of things, but I would say two of them is that it includes joy. So, so bear with me. Maybe push back on this, not in this moment, but maybe later on. I don't, I don't think the season of Lent means I've got to go around depressed and sad the entire six weeks. Having an, an awareness of your brief life actually can help you enjoy the things of this earth in a way that's honoring to the Lord. I mean, you read that article from Tim Keller in the Atlantic. One of the things he says at the very end is that my awareness of my death that's, in, that's coming soon has actually made my time with Kathy and us having meals together and sunsets and sunrises even more sweeter. There's this idea, I think sometimes when we think about if I really understand that my life is brief, then the things the gifts that God gives us, I've got to approach them with these stiff arms. I've got to stay away from them. I think that's kind of an escapist mindset that's not really helpful. love how Zach Aswan talks about this. He's actually talking about Ecclesiastes and not this psalm, but it, it works. Listen to what he says here. Consequently, the preacher, he's talking about the writer of Ecclesiastes here, also challenges escapist Christian responses to the world. Our impending death calls us to prayer and piety. Yes, true, for sure. But not in isolation from the physical provisions of God has given to us. Our spouses, our food, our place, our work, and our enjoyment of each of are not meant to fade from view when death speaks. Rather, the preacher teaches us that these provisions are meant to take their place center stage in our lives with God. These are his gifts to us and are not trash to be thrown in the dumpster while we carry our Bibles and sit in the alley waiting, not wafting. I really messed up that quote, didn't I? Waiting, wafting, wafting, waiting with praise and prayer. For death that comes. Look, man, faithful living, when we keep in mind the brevity of our life, does include joy. And, and I would add briefly here, it also includes sacrifice. So it's not just self indulgence, right? But it does include a sacrifice. If I truly believe, because remember, season of Lent is leading to what? It's not a trick question. I said it a few minutes ago. What? Easter, and what's what we celebrate on Easter? Resurrection. So if, if we, no, I know this is a stretch, but I'm just, I, I struggle. Believe in, like, if we really believe the resurrection is true, what's true of Jesus, if am I in Christ, is also true of me. And Jesus rose from the dead, so then therefore I'm going to rise from the dead. And I know it's easy for us to confessionally say that, but I'm telling you, at times it's really hard to really believe. Is that going to really happen? And I'm going to rise from the dead? And if that is true, if that is true, then therefore we can sacrifice here, right? We can say no. We can sacrifice for the good of others because this brief life is not all that there is. So you see what I'm saying? You follow me? Like, it's not either or, it's both and. Yeah, there's joy here, but there's also sacrifice. We can give up because there's coming a day where there will be no more death, where we can enjoy life with God in this new body, in this new world to its fullest. So we don't have to be people that are going around angsty. Oh my gosh, I got one life. No, I can't. No, I can't. I got to enjoy myself. <laughs> no, it's like, no, I'm, I'm going to rise again someday. So maybe it looks like faithful living more than it looks like angsty living, right? So in light of this psalm and what Ash Wednesday is supposed to help us with, maybe over the next six weeks that we call Lent, uh, I want to invite you to maybe pray some breath prayers with me, okay? And so if breath prayers are new for you, they're just a prayer that you stay in one breath. That's all it is, all right? And, and part of what I'm 
trying to do in my own life is, is to really live into having a life of prayer and not just a prayer life. And what I mean by a life of prayer is this, I, I want to just be aware of God's presence and be in continual conversation with him all throughout the day. doesn't mean there's not a space for us to pray in the morning, have some set aside time for that in the evening. I'm just trying to get more in the habit that God is with me at all times. I'm just going to have a conversation with the man. I mean, it may look really weird. People see me on the road, but so be it. Or I'm in Kroger. That was the wonderful thing about masks when we wear masks is I could talk to myself without anybody knowing what I was doing. Now I get caught. But breath prayers are just a, a simple prayer that we can say with one breath. And so what if we did this together as a body for six weeks? And I'm going to bring them on the screen. We'll have these over the next, uh, throughout the season of Lent. And I'll have Seth put these back up again so you can either take a picture now or write them down a little bit later. And these are all built out of that middle part of Psalm 39 where it says, so week one would be this, O Lord, Make me know my end and the number of my days. Oh, Lord, make me know my end and the number of my days. Week two would be, oh, Lord, help me to know how fleeting I am. Week three, oh, Lord, make me know my days are just inches long. Week four, and maybe this one's two breaths. All right, sorry. I tried to shorten down that phrase in that middle there, but I just couldn't do it. Oh, Lord, help me to reflect on the reality that every human being stands only as a vapor before you. Week five, oh, Lord, what do I wait for? Week six, oh, Lord, my hope is in you. That's resurrection week, if you're wondering. It's going to be beautiful. So as we end here, we're going to do the imposition of ashes. And look, if you don't feel comfortable doing this, hey, you do whatever your conscience permits. Amen? You do not need to do this. This is not like, you know, um, God's going to bless you more if you do them. So, but if you feel okay to do this, you can come forward. The imposition of ashes is a simply receiving kind of an outward sign and a reminder of your own mortality. The ashes imposed on our foreheads on this day are a reminder of our unworthiness and sinfulness that corrupts and stains us and leads us to death. The ashes remind us of our original sin, of our need for redemption, and our need to be cleansed in and through His Son, Jesus Christ. So come forward here in just a minute. We'll have two stations. We'll have one here to my right and one here to my left. And you'll be marked. You'll have a cross. And the individual, myself and Zach, will say, from dust you came to dust you shall return. And so once again, if you do not feel comfortable doing this, please hear me, you do not need to do this. But I want to close with this little slide here and I'm going to ask you to read the underlying portions with me. And then I'm going to pray and then Zach and I will go to our stations and then you can just kind of form two lines and come when you're ready. So Father God, you have created us out of the dust of the earth and say this with me. May these ashes remind us of our mortality and frailty and teach us again that only by your gracious gift are we given everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
mercy on me, O oh God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgression, but mercy on me, O oh God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Lord, how my transgression would you create a clean heart, O oh Lord? Restore you the joy of your salvation. Would you create? Sacrifices of our God are a broken and contrived heart against you and you alone. Have I sinned? Sacrifices of our God are a broken and contrived heart against you and you alone. Have I sinned? stand together and I'll do a benediction once again. Thanks for coming. Um, I know this is a unique service, but it's a really good and fruitful service for us all. So um, yeah, so in, in good sojourn fashion, if you want to receive this benediction, you can kind of have your hands out here. Just receive it as a gift. So uh, today, now may we, may we, out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, now may we, the God of peace himself, sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Church, go now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Peace be with you.